Question, why do we still remember the Great Fire of London today? Well, here's the answer. Or maybe you should stop watching this video and go do your own research, you piece of- Calm your lies, man, I'm kidding. Just calm down, it's okay. One might answer by saying that it was because it was a humongous fire that engulfed a third of London, duh. But if we dig deeper and actually look at the details, we can see it is much more than just that vague statement. On Sunday the 2nd of September 1666, we know that King Charles II's baker, Thomas Farriner, started a fire in his bakery to cook some bread. But going upstairs, he forgot about the fire, and as a result, the smouldering embers ignited some nearby firewood, allowing it to spread. In three hours, Farriner's bakery in Pudding Lane was in flames, and Farriner, his wife, daughter, and one servant managed to escape. The maid was not so fortunate, however, and already the Great Fire had taken one victim. Back then, London had not experienced a catastrophe as devastating as the Great Fire, so houses were still made of wood, and was spaced very close together. Therefore, the fire was able to spread easily and quickly. Roofs were made of thatch, a material that burned easily, and the wind also blew the fire down narrow streets. On top of that, the summer of 1666 had been particularly dry with drought, heightening the chances that fires would spread. So, some might say we remember this event as one of London's biggest disasters due to the fact that it all started because one man forgot about a small-scale fire that escalated in a matter of mere hours and it all could have been prevented. Now, why exactly was the Great Fire so bad, or great as it is called? Well, some accounts say it lasted for three days, yet others such as Samuel Pepys' implication in his diary say it was for four, due to the fire supposedly starting in the early hours of Sunday the 2nd as opposed to the later hours. Either way, it lasted for just under five days and managed to destroy a third of London and make around 70,000 people homeless out of the 80,000 inhabitants at the time, with the traditional death toll being surprisingly low for such a fire, just six verified deaths. However, there could very well have been many, many more people killed, as the poor and middle classes' deaths were not recorded. Even if officials would have taken the time to investigate further, the remains of victims would have been completely destroyed in the scorching 1700 degrees Celsius fire, a temperature at which even stone melt. It would make much more sense that several hundred, and quite possibly several thousand people likely perished, as author Neil Hansen writes in his book named The Great Fire of London in the apocalyptic year 1666. Considering the fire wiped out almost 90% of homes in the city, famous buildings including St Paul's Cathedral, the Royal Exchange and the Guide Hall were completely destroyed, as well as 13,200 houses and 87 parish churches. After the fire had ended though, there was still a huge problem for all classes of people. The approximate damage cost of the fire in the 17th century was 10 million pounds. Today, that is at least 36 billion pounds. Though the actual cost could be much, much more due to business interruptions. Wages were very low and every single working citizen had to pay to repair for everything that had been damaged or obliterated. As a result, London faced an enormous economical crisis, leaving even those of the richer classes ruined. With virtually no fire insurance, many moved away permanently. The unluckier ones, such as the poor, were now in a somewhat greater despair for their lives. Samuel Pepys writes in his diary that upon observation on Sunday, nobody tried to put out the fire at first as they were busy running for their lives, which is understandable. But there were many attempts at stopping the fire, including using water, and theoretically, this should have been the best strategy as Pudding Lane was very near to the River Thames and firefighters would have a constant supply of water. However, people were not used to dealing with such a menace and failed to do the job properly. In the end though, London Bridge was the only physical connection between the city and the south of the River Thames, and it was covered with houses. So while many feared the flames would cross London Bridge and threaten the borough of Southwark, this danger was averted by houses being demolished to create an open space where the fire could no longer spread so easily. Additionally, a section of the bridge was missing, meaning a halt for what would have most certainly been more destruction. In the late summer of 1666, London was a sad and emotional city. Many loved ones had been lost, so many lives had been taken, and the Great Plague, which had made too many suffer, had only just ended. And so the reconstruction of London began, which took six to eight months. Several proposals were put forward, including ones by Sir Christopher Wren, John Evelyn and Robert Hooke, but almost all of them were rejected, as so many interests were involved and it was important to get the city back on its feet quickly. Then one plan by Richard Newcourt, which involved a rigid grid with churches and squares, was however later used for the layout of Philadelphia, USA. In October 1666, King Charles appointed commissioners, including Christopher Wren, to regulate the rebuilding. Wren's idea was to widen or straighten streets, ease bottlenecks and add a new street to be built by carving through private properties. This was King Street, which led from Guide Hall to the Wharf. Scattered street markets were moved into new special market halls, but there were no plans to create a city with fine new buildings and public spaces, possibly to save the cost of another potential city rebuild, should another disaster occur. Therefore, there were no new public squares. Some buildings, such as the Four Gates, Ludgate, Newgate, Moorgate and Temple Bar were now decorative rather than useful. 
by 1676 all the area of the fire had been rebuilt, with the exception of some of the sites with parish churches. So perhaps the Great Fire of London is remembered to this day due to stories passed down to generations, or merely because of the various differences between rebuilt London and pre-Great Fire London, and the fact that there's such a contrast, or even because the impacts made a significant mark on the economy, the city, and its inhabitants. London Today, a steel, glass and stone city. What hasn't been mentioned so far is the monument to the Great Fire of London, a 62 meter column to commemorate the lives taken by the Great Fire, located 60 meters from the exact spot where the fire started, Baroness Bakery in Pudding Lane. So Christopher Wren designed the column after deciding that there should be a memorial. It is currently the tallest freestanding stone column in the world. At the entrance to the monument are three Latin inscriptions, all describing how the fire started, the damage it caused, and how King Charles II dealt with it. At the very top is an urn of flames, as the king refused a statue of himself to be built there, stating that he didn't start the fire. As soon as the monument was built, six people threw themselves from the top with one other falling accidentally. Because of this, people joked that more people died falling from the monument than burning in the fire itself. Regardless, as Samuel Pepys writes, the fire caused the saddest sight of desolation ever to be seen. If nothing else, it is this giant of a monument itself, which is all you need to remember what happened in September 1666. In a way, we have a reason to thank this devastation. If it hadn't happened, London would not look the way it looks today. Some people even think the fire wiped out the Great Plague completely. After the fire had stopped, what people still feared the most was not another fire, but the return of the dreaded Black Death, as people thought the fire was just another way of God unleashing his wrath. But if it is true that the cause for the disease's departure was a gargantuan fire that consumed a third of London, then it may not have been a complete apparent punishment from God after all. Also, the fire created the opportunity to build, in the central area, a city in a new form, which would quickly become the hub of the British Empire in the following decades. So, the creation of the Empire does owe something to the Great Fire of London.